together. Uh, my original plan tonight was to be in Psalms chapter 27. We've been going through uh, the book of Psalms chapter by chapter, and uh, we would be up to Psalms chapter 27. However, since I didn't actually finish this morning's message, uh, we'll go ahead and, and work on that right now. Um, I've been thinking about it, praying about it, and um, since, there's, since there's people here that were here this morning that heard it, I might as well finish it, right? Amen. All right, so, so Acts chapter 17, Acts chapter 17, I'll read this again and then we'll focus in on chapter 31. Again, the context is uh, Paul has been preaching in Athens about Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of his focal points. And that gets the attention of, of the locals, uh, the philosophers and the, uh, the, local, uh, the uh, local religious people. And they take him up uh, to the Aragopagus, uh, Mars Hill. And, and basically, um, it's, it's neat. There's, if you look at it, there's a place they believe to be Mars Hill. You can see pictures of it. It's this big rock. Um, and it was not just a place, but uh, it's interesting. There was the place, and that was called that, but the group of people that assembled there were called uh, by that name, too, and, and it's just this assembly. I, I don't have time to get into all that, but uh, if you get a chance, study that if you haven't. Uh, it's pretty neat. The historical aspects that Acts covers uh, are pretty neat, and I've always enjoyed being able to go read about those towns and some of the stuff honestly is still in some of these places um, I, I always think about Ephesus right the where they pulled the people in and for hours shouted great is the goddess Diana that that theater is still there um, I've seen pictures of it and so it's just neat to think about uh, some of those things but here uh, as you read this of course in verse 22 Paul uh, stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and behold your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needeth, uh, need anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. He hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on, uh, on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though it be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and by man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto them, and believed among uh, among the which was Diosthenes the Agagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Of course, we see here uh, at the end of Paul declaring the gospel, uh, as it is almost every time Paul goes somewhere and preaches the gospel, there's people that hear it and reject it. And there's people that hear it and accept it and believe it and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in, in this case, there's, uh, we aren't told who all it was, but we are given two names. Um, and, and at least one of these is a person of some prominence. He, he is uh, one of the group of people that Paul would have been preaching to that had gathered to declare uh, this message and believes on the Lord. 
Now, what I want to focus on today, right, we've already talked about the fact that God's talked about uh, who, he, who He is coming and who He is carrying this message for is the God of heavens, the God that created everything, the God that gives us life and breath, uh, that made all nations of one blood, that set the bounds and the habitations. Um, and in verse 27, He even tells them that they should seek the Lord. Listen, He, <laughs> he created this world. He created man. He gives them life, breath. He's divided out the course of their life and their boundaries and where they're going to be and, and has even said, like, they should seek Him. And they can find Him if they'll seek Him. These are some things that He told them. And then He tells them, man, the time has come. God's not going to look the other way. God is sending judgment. God is... God is sending the message of repentance to you. You need to believe it. And in verse 31, he says, Because he hath appointed a day. God knows exactly the day and the time that final judgment is coming. I don't. Me and you could try to guess it all day long. Me and you could try to guess when the Lord's coming back. Me and you could try to guess when this is going to happen, this is going to happen. Listen, the interesting thing about this statement, it's like a matter of fact. Like, God has appointed a day of judgment. God knows. It was not but a few chapters ago in chapter 15 when uh, James was quoting from the Old Testament and he talked about that... Um, he was using this verse that really wasn't even focused on the fact that it was about Gentiles, but in it he t talked about that there were heathen that were going to be called by the name of the Lord. And he told that. At the, at the end of that, he says this in Acts chapter 15, verse 8, Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. His opening statement in verse 31 is a very similar thing. He says, Because he hath appointed a day... If, if you were on trial, your court date has been set. <laughs> Judgment is coming. The Lord is going to rule. Make a ruling on your case, right? Judgment is coming. He has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. And he is going to judge the world in righteousness. The judge is righteous. His judgments will be righteous. And they will be based on righteousness. Now for those that are redeemed, we're told the Bible, is, the Bible tells us that we are covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Will you accept the fact that Jesus Christ came and died for your sins? It was a few chapters ago that Paul basically took, took the, the Jews that were rejecting the message that he had been preaching and he told them that they considered themselves, that they didn't, um, I'm trying to think of the way he worded it, he basically said worthy of eternal life. It wasn't that they felt, we can read that and think the wrong thing, it wasn't that they felt like, oh, I don't deserve eternal life. It was they thought, I don't need your message, Paul. I'm of Abraham's seed. I already have what I need, right? But Paul was telling them, listen, your rejection of Jesus Christ is actually telling that you, you don't want eternal life. You don't, you don't count worthy of eternal life. When the righteous judge comes and he rules righteously, if you are not covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, you will be found guilty. And you will. I'm using the, I'm trying to emphasize these terms. This is not a maybe. You will be found guilty. You will be judged. And you will suffer the condemnation that comes with that. But on the flip side, if you will just repent of your sins 
and turn in faith to Jesus Christ and he saves your soul, you will be covered by his righteousness. You will stand before the king forgiven, redeemed, purchased, and you will spend an eternity with him, right? These are emphatic statements. These are facts. <laughs> you say, well, this, none of this stuff has happened yet. The thing you've got to realize is that when it deals with what God has said is going to happen, you don't have to talk about them like it might happen. These are factual statements. This is, this is going to happen. And he's looking at this group of people. I don't know how many of them it was. He is the center stage. Man, he is front and center. And as he's preaching, he looks them. He looks right at this group and he says, judgment is coming. And the judge is perfect in righteousness. You have no hope to stand before this judge short of Jesus Christ. And this judge is going to be the very one that I've been preaching to you about. This one Jesus Christ that died and rose again that I've, you've heard me talk about. Listen, he is coming back and he is going to rule and reign and he is going to be the judge and he's going to separate left and right. We've heard all those other passages, right? Man, you need to repent. Now, the one thing I want to think about, and we'll try to spend most of the rest of our time in this. When he says, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Who's that man? Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know how many times I've read Acts chapter 17. Didn't really make a connection to an Old Testament scripture. I have other commentaries that I've used, and every list I've looked at does not include this verse. And so I'm going to be a little bit lenient in regards to whether it is a coincidence that the phraseology here is very similar or whether he's quoting I don't know, but I will tell you the thought process behind what he just said is so rampant in the Old Testament that there is coming a righteous judge, right? But listen to these. I want you to think about these. First, turn over to Psalms chapter 96. Psalms chapter 96. There's three different passages in Psalms that we want to talk about. I'm going to read the whole chapter, okay? There's really only one verse we're talking about, but I'm going to read the whole chapter. Psalm chapter 96. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. What is Paul doing right in the middle of all this? You can't have a better description than verse 3. Declare his glory among the heathen. He is speaking to a crowd of Greek and Roman pagan worshipers. And what has he been declaring? I'm going to talk to you about the God that created everything. The God that sent his only son who's coming back as a righteous judge. Man, he is declaring among the heathen his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Where is Paul? He is preaching to a group of people who he said, you worship everything. You, matter of fact, you worship so much, you even created an altar to the unknown God. He says in verse 5, For all of the gods of the nations are idols 
but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come unto his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful and all that there is therein. Then shall all of the trees of wood rejoice before the Lord, for he cometh. For he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. Now, I have no idea if when Paul preached that message and he says in verse 31, he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. I have no idea whether he was thinking about Psalms chapter 96 or not, but Psalms chapter 96 verse 13 says he's coming. Behold, the Lord cometh. There's a time appointed. He's coming. And what's he coming to do? He shall judge the world with righteousness. Jehovah is coming to judge the world with righteousness. It just is neat to me to think about that that phrase shows up in a chapter that really echoes a whole lot of what you see Paul doing in the very moment that Paul himself uttered those words. Standing before this group of leaders of this pagan city that was fraught with worship of every kind of idol you could think of, and here he is standing before them declaring the majesty of the God that created the heavens. And in that chapter, the phrase is used that he's coming to judge the world in righteousness. Now, Paul was a well-studied man who knew the scriptures inside and out. I have no idea if this is, this is just me, but I'm sitting here thinking, <laughs> as Paul's standing before this group and he's preaching this, did Psalms 96 come to his mind? Like, man, I'm preaching against, uh, I'm standing here and there's idols all around me and these people worship idols and all this stuff. These people need to know that the judge is coming and he will judge righteously. So Psalm chapter 96, I think, uh, is an open praise and declaration of the glory and the majesty of God and ends with the statement that he is coming to judge and when he judges, he will judge righteously. You could also take your Bibles and turn over a couple chapters to Psalms chapter 98. Psalms chapter 98. It's a very similar psalm. It says, O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. <laughs> We've talked about this before. When we talk about God, we talk about Jesus Christ, the world does not think about dying on the cross as victory. Remember, the, the people that were enemies of Christ, man, they thought they had been victorious. They were so confident. He was hanging on the cross. He was dying. And they were down there mocking him. Oh, you that said you'd destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. You know, blah, blah, blah. Or you saved others and you can't save yourself. And I mean, they're just mocking. And you can tell they are a people that feel like they have finally gotten victory. But we're told in Acts, even earlier in Acts, that all they were doing was fulfilling God's plan. The very thing they thought was bringing them victory is actually the, the thing that was showing that God's plan was coming to be, right? 
that says here in verse 1 that we're to make a joyful noise because he hath gotten the victory. In verse 2, the Lord hath made known his salvation. His righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. Paul is again standing where? Declaring what? He's standing in front of a group of heathen people declaring the salvation of the Lord. Verse 3, He hath remembered His mercy and His truth toward the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. The gospel of Jesus Christ was starting to spread across the whole world. It still had a long way to go, but at this time you are starting to see the fulfillment of so many Old Testament passages that show that... Um, through the seed of Abraham, the world, whole world would be blessed. And that, you know, this idea of heathens uh, from all nations would call upon the name of the Lord. Verse 4, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with the harp with the harp and with the voice of a psalm, with trumpets and the sound of a coronet, make a joyful noise before the Lord, the King. Let the sea roar in the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Let the floods clap with their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for he cometh to judge the earth. With righteousness shall he judge the world and the people with equity. Psalm chapter 98, dealing with praising and glorifying and worshiping Jehovah, talking about how he's going to have victory and how that his salvation is going to be declared and that all of the nations of the heathens will see it. Ends with, he's coming. Behold, he's coming to judge the earth. And when he comes, he's going to judge in righteousness. It's the exact same phrase that Paul used in Acts chapter 17 when he said, listen, there has been appointed a day. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. Again, is Paul quoting Psalms chapter 98 verse 9? I don't know. But both of them, both of those chapters speak about the salvation and the works of the Lord being declared among the heathen and end with the idea that you better be ready because the righteous judge is coming. It very well fits what Paul was doing at that very moment. I want you to also turn, if you would, to Psalms chapter 9. <clears throat> Psalms chapter 9. We've, of course, as we've went through Psalms, we've already hit this chapter, so we're not going to spend a ton of time here, but just going to read this and then focus on a handful of specific verses. In verse 1 it says, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O Thou Most High. Just, I'm going to pause there for a second. Paul is preaching, but in preaching the message he's preaching to the people he's preaching it to, he is actually doing this. He is giving praise to the Most High. You know, when we stand up and we declare the glory of God, when we talk to people about the amazing grace and mercy of Jesus Christ and how he died for the sinner, you know what we're doing? Yeah, hey, listen, we're, we're fulfilling his command. We're, we're sharing the gospel message. Uh, we're telling others about him. Yeah, all of those things. But we're also worshiping God. We're praising God in those things. We're giving God the glory for the way of salvation. 
Verse 3, when mine enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou settest in the throne judging right. Thou hast rebuked the heathen. Thou hast destroyed the wicked. Thou hast put out their name forever and ever. O thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end. And thou hast destroyed cities. Their memorial is perished with them. Verse 7. But... The Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment, and he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. He is praising the Lord. He's declaring the majesty of the Lord. He's saying, listen, the enemies, man, they may have had some success. They may have had some victories. But listen, there is coming a time when they are going to face the ultimate judge and he will judge them in all righteousness and it isn't going to be good for them. So he's talking about destruction of these. Um, the enemies are going to be uh, come to a perpetual end. Verse 7, the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. Verse 9, the Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Amen. Those that put their trust in the Lord, did you catch that? Those that put their trust in the Lord will not be forsaken. When the righteous judge comes to judge righteously, who is it that will be spared? Those that have put their trust in Him. Those that have put their trust in Him. And he says, For thou, Lord, has not forsaken them that seek thee. I want you to think about that phrase, them that seek thee. What was it that Paul told the people up on Mars Hill just a few sentences before what we're talking about right now? In verse 27 of Acts chapter 17, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Another passage in Psalms with that phrase that he is coming and he is going to judge the world in righteousness also brings with it the message of if you seek him, he will be found and he won't forsake those that seek him. It's just neat to me to look at these three passages because, again, I, I don't know if that exact phrase is meant to be a direct quote of any of these three chapters. But the concept behind that statement is absolutely echoed in all three of those chapters. And all three of those chapters so very well fit Paul standing before a whole group of heathens declaring who God really is and talking about this one Jesus who came and who died and who rose again and his resurrection he told them is a sign of assurance that he's coming to judge righteously all three of these passages talk about the glory of God all three of these passages deal with this idea of, of God being the protector of those that seek Him. So, the messages that are in these three chapters, the message that Paul is preaching in Acts chapter 17 it still stands today. If 
if you're here today and you're lost, if you're here today and you're lost, you are no different. You are no different than those ultra paganistic heathens sitting on the top of Mars Hill, some mocking, some curious, but all guilty. All, whether they know it or not, awaiting the day when the judge shows up and says, today's the day and you will stand before me in judgment. We mentioned it already this morning. Listen, you do not, you do not want to stand before God without the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us it's very, on one hand it's very detailed and on the other hand I'd say we know very little about it. The Bible does a good job with a little bit of information to tell us just how bad eternal separation from God is. We know the rich man, when he died and lifted up his, hell, his eyes, being in torments, simply wanting a little bitty drop of water. Can you imagine being in so much agony that a drop of water would be a relief? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the righteous judge is coming, and he will judge in righteousness. I don't want anybody to have to stand before the Lord on their own merit because there's not a single person in all time that will even come close to being able to stand under the judgment of God. The gospel message to these heathens and to the heathens in this room is the same. You have no hope other than the resurrected Christ. Paul is having to tell this group, hey look, those wood statues, those gold statues, those silver statues, that altar to the unknown God, the unknown God none of that is going to do you any good None of that's going to do you any good. What you need, you need to turn to Jesus Christ, the one who came and died, rose again the third day, and is one day coming back to judge this world. That's what you need. The sad thing is that it seems like every time Every time the gospel message is preached, when you look through the book of Acts, there's those that see it, hear it, turn, believe it, want to know more. And there's those that leave rejecting it, not wanting it. And there's various ways, by the way, of those that have rejected it. Some just reject it and fight against it. Some reject it in total disbelief. Some are kind of like 
you know, almost you've convinced me. Right? Almost you've convinced me. But every single person that has taken a breath in this world will one day stand before the judge. The amazing thing is that there is forgiveness available. There is redemption available. There is a path to being accepted as Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I will not apologize for that message. That's the message that we need to be carrying out to this world. Well, they don't like it. They hate it. They'll despise you for it. They're tired of it. None of those things matter. None of those things matter. What matters is that we've been commanded to carry the message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And that's what we want to do. That's what we're trying to do here. We need to be faithful. We need to be vigilant. We need to be bold. May the Lord grant us those things because I know we can't do it on our own. All right. With that, we're going to go ahead and ask Brother Philip to come and lead us in a song. As Brother Philip comes, we'll go ahead and stand.